hi guys, I'm George Davis, founder and CEO of Frame.ai. Uh, my talk here is on bias, variance, and data products, and I'm going to explain what that means in a second, but I hope everyone has merely had their appetites wet for discussing data products by the uh, great uh, keynote we just had. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about practitioner work and, and how we actually go about building teams and informing those teams to build data products. But first, just a little bit about me, or more accurately about my company. So Frame.ai is a conversational technology startup focused on improving business conversations, and especially ones that have multiple people in the loop. So not replacing people, but finding ways to augment the conversations they're already having, especially if those conversations need to be informed by substantial amounts of data. And then finally, recognizing this as one part of a complex relationship that involves a lot of touch points between these people. And that's actually about all I'm going to say about us. We're keeping a pretty low profile through the end of the year. And most of what I'm going to talk about is things that have actually been on my mind for a long time um, as I discovered and started working on data products and maybe are things that you've run into as well. And let me just ask to start with how many people here are currently working on data products as opposed to other kinds of operational data science? OK, I see a lot of hands half up. Is there, maybe there's like ambiguity about what data products mean. In my case, I'm talking about systems where they're making decisions that are informed by and determined by substantial amounts of data that might not even be available at the time that you're designing the product. Uh, and this is actually something that's been happening for a really long time. Uh, so well before I discovered the term data science, uh, I was chasing data around, and I'm sure many of us were, under the guise of scientific computing. And we found these in early technologies like network analysis, search, bioinformatics, GPS and logistical analytics, automated trading. And it wasn't until I kind of poked my head out of the automated trading world and went to Newton, where I headed up data science before starting Frame.ai, that I realized that this was, we were living through, I had this Forrest Gump moment that something really fundamental had changed about my career, which I thought was pretty much set, which was teaching computers to do, uh, to make scientific inferences from data. And what had changed was there were suddenly consumers who were extremely aware of the data that we had about them. They were aware of the value that could be produced by products that utilized that data, and they were starting to form expectations. And companies that wanted to deliver these products needed people to help manage those expectations and understand uh, what the data actually could do for them. And so this data science term, which when I first encountered, I thought of it as it's kind of just a branding thing, sorry, DJ and Jeff. But uh, the need for branding was very important because you, we suddenly needed to be able to set and maintain user expectations. Uh, and, they, and users needed someone to blame when those expectations weren't met. And I think blame is actually the right word in a lot of cases. So I've got blurbs up here from five incredible products. These are products that objectively do uh, amazing things, and yet they have failure modes that are very common knowledge, very well publicized, and get a lot of specific derision. It's because if you have a system that does objectively amazing things, but then sometimes does objectively stupid things, it's very easy for people to focus on the latter. It's much easier to lose trust than to build it. And so the process of escaping these we need new processes for building products that escape these traps and that set expectations as well as we possibly can. And many of us, I think, in this room are either part of those processes, are designing those processes, or uh, uh, <laughs> at least at the other end of, the, of them. And I think one of the things that causes a lot of complication in the development of data products and in the set of, setting of expectations is that data products inherently violate one of the key principles of product design, which is principle of least surprise. In some ways, if a data product isn't capable of surprising you, if it's not learning something from the data that you couldn't have defined a priori, then it's not really doing its job. And so, uh, whereas when you're developing a traditional product, you tend to have one ac major axis of complexity in terms of user behaviors that you have to worry about, and that's between convention and configuration. So there's some parts of your product that are a common experience for everyone, and that's a very simple way relatively to design a product because you just have one set of behaviors that you have to make sure meet people's expectations. And then configuration, where you actually have people able to use the product in very different ways and express their own needs and have a different product experience. 
And even with just this one axis, it can be very hard to design good products. If, you, if too much is configurable, it's very hard for users to understand how to use it, and it's very hard for you to think through all of the edge cases of how someone might misconfigure your product and have a bad expectation that they blame you for. Data products add an entire new axis of complexity to this problem. Uh, the fact that some of your behavior is determined by data instead of, uh, instead of in advance means even if you have one user experience being informed by that data, if it's the result of an optimization process, you might be surprised by what your system ends up doing. Uh, if, it's an, if you're actually going for adaptivity, so if you're separating out some portions of the data that apply to individual users and you're giving them a different experience based on their, based on their particular data path through your product, uh, then all of a sudden, uh, you have uh, this multiplication of the types of complexity that you have to worry about. And a lot of the failure modes that I put on the slide before, I think, are cases where people, had, uh, there, people were in edge cases of these combinations of complexity that the designers hadn't anticipated. So how do we start trying to think about anticipating those? Well, since I'm coming from a data science background, for the, so the three roles here, data scientist, data engineer, product manager, these are pretty new factorization of this problem. Uh, and I'm actually curious, how many people in this room consider, would identify as a data scientist? Okay, this is the data science track, that makes sense. What about a data engineer? Okay, lots of overlap, makes sense. What about product managers? Yes, all right, you have to tell me which parts of this I got right and wrong at the end. But uh, the, uh, and what about other functions, business roles, et cetera? All right, so uh, factoring, because I'm a data scientist, I think of this as sort of a factored optimization problem. We're all working, I don't know how readable that actually is, but we're all working to maximize the expected value that a user retrieves from our product, perhaps minus some cost of what it took us to deliver that, can measure, or maybe some of the cost that they took in coming into the product. Uh, by manipulating different parts of the product that we own. So the product manager might own the expectations, they might set some of the engineering affordances, the data scientist might determine the model that's available, the data engineers might be developing the systems that determine which data is available for the model. So we each own these parameters and we're working together to optimize these functions. But in many cases, it's not just the parameters we own, but we own the expertise in evaluating an aspect of this function. So the, the data engineers are in a best position to understand what the costs in terms of a development cycle of adding certain data, uh, of reaching certain engineering affordances are, or making certain types of data available. The data scientist is more or less responsible for understanding the probabilistic aspect of the behavior. What's the distribution of your users? If we make these choices, what kind of distribution of experiences are people actually going to get? And the product manager is usually responsible for understanding what the value of those experiences is to the user. And, because this is an incredibly high dimensional space, nobody really owns a, knowledge, a map of, their, of even their entire space. At best, we can kind of evaluate our functions, maybe uh, communicate a few gradients. And when we go through trading documents between each other or testing each other's work, we're basically doing this partial gradient descent on this function where each of us try to improve our little locus of the product. And one consequence of that is because all parts have to be able to, to act to move forward is that we get blocked all the time. Uh, so you know, a data engineer can block a data scientist by making data inaccessible, not operationalized in the way they expected it, so they have to go back through and clean it. Uh, product manage, a data scientist can block a product manager by having behaviors, producing behaviors that weren't predicted and then uh, fall, keep them from delivering value to the customer. And pretty much everyone in here along the main diagonal uh, allows themselves to be blocked if they're not capable of stepping outside their function, if they can't actually, if they need to await sort of a perfect input from their collaborators in order to render some opinion or take a step forward on their part of the process. So this is a very fragile process. There's so many ways here and anything that goes wrong on one of these lists can end up blocking the other ones. So how do we make it less fragile? Well, one thing we can think about doing is only hiring triple unicorns. What if, we, what if everybody we hired can do all of these roles and they just understand everything about the product? And that would be really nice. Um, if you find any of those, let me know. But this is kind of mostly joking, uh, but, it's, but there's a serious aspect to this, which is uh, when I'm hiring, one of the main things I focus on 
it, as soon as I know that someone has something to contribute, that they have some that they have some talent that extends the capabilities of the team, almost everything else is is this person unblockable? Can, are, are we hiring someone who knows enough about their interface points to uh, you know do, to, to ETL their own way out of a data deficiency and so on? So there's that aspect when you're building your team. Another one is sitting together. This really simple thing that, and it's one of these things, if you've always been doing it, it's completely obvious, but it's surprising how many people don't do it. A lot of people actually prefer to sit in functional roles. They get to exchange best practices. They get to think about career paths. Uh, but if you're going to iterate on this problem quickly, you need to have up to the moment access to each other. And so actually putting teams that have to do this into a configuration where they can execute a tight loop is a really important uh, decision that you have to make when designing your product teams. Uh, and then the final one, which is really the focus of this talk, is communicating trade-offs, not evaluations. So if you try to do a gradient descent where each of these people is only communicating where their function is based on the choices other people have made, then you won't be able to move forward very quickly. But if you can communicate to each other something about the directionality and the trade-offs that you're currently facing right now in your function, then they can make some choices thinking for you and thinking, thinking around your problems, and everyone can move forward faster. And so the talk is really about these three concepts that I think are good, especially for data scientists, to communicate in terms of the trade-offs that affect their role. And you're, I had this cute idea to base these on statistical uh, properties, and you'll have to tell me how stretched they are later. Uh, but the first one is bias variance trade-off. And I, I picked this one partially as an excuse to show my favorite cartoon from all of statistics, which is, well, it's not, not a funny cartoon, but a very explanatory cartoon. So this is showing us how decisions about our model space and whether we pick more or less biased models affect the amount of variance that our model actually ends up producing. And so the red line reflects a very expressive model that has the capability to come much closer to expecting the, ap the actual truth of the underlying distribution. The purple line here is a, 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 a model that is in some sense more wrong. It can't come anywhere near as close to actually encompassing this true distribution, but it is much more opinionated about what kind of distributions it might see. And as a result, even though it's not as objectively accurate as the other model, it varies a lot less when the data it receives varies. And that's very important to this principle of least surprise argument, because it allows you, it's much easier to calibrate user expectations to a behavior that's not ideal than it is to calibrate user expectations to not having any idea what the behavior will be. So in plain English, the, the version of this trade-off is to keep in mind that the value your model produces is the product of the availability of plentiful data about the thing that you're studying, make the good assumptions your model makes about what, it, what shape, it's, what the form of it's trying to find in the data is, and the tolerance for error in which the model is deployed. And so if you're short on any one of these things, you better be very, very long in the other ones. That's what the bias variance trade-off tells you from a practical business perspective. And I think this is something that everyone involved in data products should know and sort of have in the back of their heads, whether you're at the business level, whether you're an investor, et cetera. And nine times out of 10, we try to solve this at the business level by making sure that we're doing something that's gonna have access to a lot of data. I actually think that's an interesting, uh, uh, I think there's a lot of interesting problems that we're gonna be discovering that are more about medium-sized data, the large data, as opposed to big data in the near future. But, even when you have uh, maneuvered yourself where, into a place where you have access to large amounts of data about a problem, uh, you have places where sparsity can sneak in. Few data sets are large in every way that matters. So on the left here, we've got a guy who is about to experience his first Black Friday. If your data set has some form of seasonality that you have not yet experienced, you have an opportunity for an enormous amount of surprise coming down the pipe. Uh, at the top right, uh, if I'm trying to find a uh, leash for my dog, pet, puppy, cat, kitty, uh, then Amazon might put right up next to each other uh, two four-star products, one of whom, which has 2,000 reviews and the other one has 32. Um, reasonable choice, hard to know how to compare these. Really just pointing out here that any individual object in your data set might be at the beginning of its life, and there might be very little data about that particular object. So you have to think about every life cycle of a data entity. 
And then finally, even in a data set that's matured, where you, where you have a stable and, and you, your product has been in the market for a long time, and you have a stable system that you're providing value to, you can have these power law effects. Humans love to produce power law effects because we kind of follow each other and we chase each other and we attach preferentially. And so if you're, the arrows are a little bit off here, but if you're delivering, if this is your social network, very mature, lots of people, the experience of someone on your new feed product is gonna be very different if they're somewhere near the core of this network as opposed to someone near the periphery. And uh, ho I bet most of the people here have done this, but if you have friends who kind of live at the periphery of Facebook, it's definitely worth taking a, or family, it's worth taking a chance to look at how different the product experience is of a lot of the things that you might take for granted, especially when, pro when features first come out. Um, so so e even in very large data sets, you can have sparsity that can really affect behaviors for some people. Um, so how do we solve this? And this is something I'm going to do for each of these, is I'm going to talk about some very well-known examples of companies solving this in ways that I think are pretty good. Um, and, one of, and categorizing them. So one of them here is when you have a low amount, when you have an area of sparse data, fail over to a high bias model. Uh, so on the left, I thought this Google search result was very interesting. When I, when I re repeat my cat leash search, if I've just typed cat, in an incognito window where I haven't already searched for cat leashes 100 times, it's kind of a hobby, uh, then Google it biases towards a set of returns that has a very high diversity in interpreting the word cat. So if you look closely at those first three examples, cat makeup is using it in the sense of the animal. In other cases, it's the first three letters of a place or the first three letters of a company that I might be looking for information on, and so on. But even after I've searched for cat leash once and it's remembered in my history, not only is it an explicit product feature to remind me that I actually searched for this, but the subsequent returns assume that usage pattern. Uh, so the experience changes as you accumulate data about the kinds of cat-oriented searches I perform. Um, another example here is when you create a new account on Amazon. Most of us who have been buying books on Amazon for a long time have enough history that things are lumped into a very generic recommended for you category that's presented. In some case, in this case, Amazon has accurately identified that with a one-year-old son at home, I like to buy books about mealtime, a little horse, and advanced programming in the Unix environment. Uh, on the other hand, with an incognito account that had done nothing except click on a single link, it failed over to a model that had many fewer degrees of freedom. So it instead, in the same slot, presents the you viewed, I am Brian Wilson, and as a result shows me a bunch of other musician biopics. The anchoring that suggestion on one, uh, on, on a single action makes for many few, uh, a model with many fewer parameters. And then they even explain their bias by, uh, by telling me exactly why I'm getting this recommendation. Final thing you can do about this is accepting and communicating the variance. This is actually the thing I see most rarely, maybe because in most commercial arrangements, people just don't accept much variance. There's not many things where we're okay not knowing what we're paying for, or what product we're gonna get. It disturbs the unit economics of a lot of relationships. Um, but on shipping, we accept this. And so, you know, for a shipper that uh, either hasn't, there's not much shipping data about their performance on delivering cat leashes, or perhaps they just are very unreliable, I might accept the nine to f no, uh, a six day window to receive this leash uh, in exchange for these 99% positive review ratings they have, but I'm also presented with this low variance option. If I really need it between November 7th and 10th, I can get it from wag.com instead of happy dog place. Um, so uh, accepting and communicating variance is also a technique that I think works much more often for internal products. When you're making projections, when you're making predictions that are going to be uh, interpreted inside a company, there's more of an opportunity to discuss the variability in your prediction. All right, next topic, precision recall. So uh, this section is mostly about thinking about user trust and how you maintain it while you improve your product over time. So. Uh, Everybody, uh, there's all, lots of hands went up for data scientists. I expect everyone's familiar with precision recall, but just to recap, on the precision side, we have the, the idea that every time we sound an alarm, it should be accurate. Precision is how many of your total positives are true positives. Whereas recall is, 
well, if something bad happens, you definitely want to sound the alarm, and you don't mind having some false positives to do it. So, uh, so it is the percentage of total positives, of, of true positives out of um, all true. And in many cases, we have to make product decisions about a trade-off between these. Even if we have a very good model, we have to predict the confidence of the model at which we actually perform certain activities. And I'm going to suggest that in many cases, it's the extremes of, uh, of these decisions that are most valuable for customers. And it's because they, have, they create a behavior that is very understandable and very predictable. So in, as an everyday example, uh, if I'm a bike messenger, I want to make sure that every time someone might run into me, they hear my bell. And I don't care how many people who aren't going to run into me also hear my bell. So I execute a very high recall policy on every time uh, somebody might run into me with even a small probability uh, ringing that bell. Whereas if I'm a spam filter, the cost of a false positive for spam is very, very high. I don't want to actually get rid of that email. So I need a lot of precision. And it's OK if a few, uh, if a few bad emails actually get through. Um, in a single page of Google search results, we can see some really examples of both of these in these products. So on the, on the uh, ad returns and on the search results, we can see the need for high recall products. You want to absolutely make sure that if there is a relevant ad, you're going to show it. And you want to make sure that if there are relevant uh, items on the internet, I guess that's kind of an old version of this problem, that they come up. But then you have these other features, these knowledge graph features that, uh, that take up a huge amount of the screen real estate. And you only want to do that. You only want to replace your ads and search results with these features if they have a very, very high utility. And so you need a very high precision for a behavior like that. And I think one of the things that's very interesting about this behavior is that it is one where the absence of the product doesn't actually eliminate the user experience. And that gives you some flexibility in how your product develops. If you can engineer your product in such a way that the data product is a nice to have and a value add, but there's some baseline experience that's supported if your data feature can't add value, then you can afford to take a stance where you can pick a threshold of very high recall or very high precision and iterate and, and release your product early to begin, val to, to begin gaining data but maintain this level of trust that when a user actually sees your product interfere, they, they know and they can trust that the thing they're being told is useful to them. And then iterating over time on how frequently you can provide that value. So if you start with very high recall and add precision over time, you'll, you have one type of user trust. If you start with very high precision and add recall over time, then you have another. And a good example of this, uh, you know, I first started seeing those cards in my own Google searches five or six years ago. And now I see them all the time. And I found a statistic that about a third of Google searches actually have these knowledge graph instances. I think that's a case of a product being released very subtly, collecting a lot of data, and being able to uh, maintain trust as it, it added to the experience over time. And now I can find out very easily that the Steelers mascot is Steely McBeam, which I had no idea about even though I lived in Pittsburgh for nine years. So, so precision recall is something for binary classifiers, but this obviously applies to lots of other kinds of data products, too. The very general plain English version is discuss the relative costs of different kinds of errors in your data product very early and very often. Uh, if you have, uh, if at the heart of your data product is a multi-class classification problem, you can think about a cost matrix. If it's more of a prediction problem that's open-ended, you can think about a cost function. What's important is that that team of three people, the engineer, the product manager, and the data scientist, are discussing and are aware of the trade-offs when their model makes one kind of error versus another. All right, last topic here. Uh, this one doesn't have a good statistical analogy, or at least one that is highly recognizable. Uh, but I wanted to talk a little bit about coevolution. So I've set this up as an optimization problem that happens inside your company. These people, and, and when we talked about trust, we kind of started to think about how the actions inside your company affect your users. Uh, but the other dimension to this is that your users are actually going to coevolve along with your product. So depending on what kind of value you're able to offer to them, uh, you're going to get they're going to have certain learned behaviors that they feed back into your product. And that can reach some equilibriums that have a big effect on the experience of the product for everyone. And it's not completely in your control. Um, a really good example of this that came out is this uh, great study, very relevant to a lot of people lately, of the red feed, blue feed. 
this idea that people tend to group into social, uh, because people group into social groups that have a lot of agreement, there's a filter bubble where they experience content that uh, mostly agrees with them. But what's striking to me is not that, because you can make an argument about whether how natural this dichotomy is to begin with. What's striking is that you can see its effect on the content. We have, we have content that's really in, like, forwarded with the assumption that people always ready agree with it. So rather than being sort of persuasive content, it is uh, emotional and, and uh, uh, content that engages people who already hold a certain point of view. Um, on top of that, that may be a reason, not the, your intended product experience for your users. Another th part is that you may inherently need your users to keep exp having novel experiences in order to get value out of your product. So for Spotify, if everyone was left to their own devices and only, had, and only listened to the same 20 albums for their entire life, it would be hard for them to put a lot of value on a giant music collection. But if they keep discovering new things and are, and are, and are continuously reminded of how big the world of new music is and how much they enjoy it, uh, then maybe they can put a higher value there. And uh, so there's some very interesting work leaking out a little bit at a time uh, there about how they jointly optimize for preferences and novelty. So in this case, this was a Quartz article that discussed uh, sort of the multimodal nature of the preference space that users have and how, the, uh, uh, and how a playlist generated by the Spotify Weekly uh, makes use of all of these multiple modes of preferences while also selecting for things that are not too similar to tracks they've listened to before. So you can make a model that jointly optimizes for people's preferences and their immediate satisfaction for the novelty of their experience. Uh, Netflix had another approach, which they publicized on their blog about this, which was very interesting, which was essentially treating incentivizing novelty as this entire additional problem. So separate from whatever we do in terms of ranking searches, when we do show a content to a user, how can we make them, how can we especially invest in making them interested in content that's new that they necessarily don't have any familiarity with before? And they, they did that by generating a lot of different types of user experiences and testing to optimize which content was shown to incentivize people to try a new product, uh, even varying it by different region. So in this case, it was discovered that for the very same material, you could get people to try it out for the first time substantially, with substantially different effects if you used these different posters in these different countries. Um, and there's some very good academic work now coming out that's also about making explicit incentivization mechanisms built into your product uh, for, um, uh, for incentivizing novelty. So just to kind of sum up and review some of these, the, uh, the, main folk, the main things I wanted people to walk away with are that you can increase the performance of your products, of your data product teams, A, by mapping the edges of the data and understanding how they're going to evolve over time thinking about that data through time, and planning for the low data regions, uh, for the low data experiences of your product to be met with high bias models or the communication of variants that lets people have an, uh, an, a user experience that's still uh, within their expectation. Um, secondly, it's very important not to treat all errors as equal. And if, if there's not a lot of communication between a product manager team and a data science team, it can be very hard to know what the real error function behind it that you should be optimizing is when you design your models. So compare different kinds of error impacts early and often, and think about targeting specific limitations on specific types of errors so that you can at least make some confident promises to your customers and improve on other types of value over time. Uh, finally, track and plan on users adapting to your product. And uh, there are creative ways. There's ways that we can help. You know, a lot of times data science is being blamed right now for this filter bubble and for these algorithmic potholes that systems get stuck in. But there's ways that we can help break out of those potholes too. Um, communicating about these fundamentals helps everyone on the team think ahead about the product and each other's functions and not get blocked. There's lots of other good reading about this. So uh, classic DJ Patel's building da data science teams, old but still great. Uh, Margaret Zwimmer had a, had a great article a few years ago about drivetrain, a, a drivetrain approach to building data products from Kaggle. Uh, Anu Tewan from Intuit presented at Grace Hopper this year on the product playground. That's, very, that's a talk that's essentially a product manager's version of this talk, and it's very interesting. It has some great Star Trek metaphors. Uh, and then just recently, DJ Patel, again in first round, what we wish we'd known about developing adaptive data products for the government. 
um, all, great, uh, all great additional perspectives on this if you're building out your team and your practices. Um, and that's it for me. So thanks. Uh, let's talk about this or conversational commerce and AI or anything else you want to talk about in the office hours. Also the obligatory, we are hiring jobs at frame.ai. If you're interested, if you want to know what we're doing, don't hesitate to reach out.